If you had to pick just one muscle that, when developed properly, has the biggest visual impact on your overall appearance, what muscle would you pick? Your back? Quads? Glutes? I think I'd pick the shoulders because when they're well developed, they make everything else just look better. Your waist looks smaller and more tapered, your whole body takes on more of an X-frame, assuming you train legs as well, and everything else about your shape just seems to fit in better. So if your goal is to maximize the development of the shoulders, it's important to first consider their anatomy. The deltoid muscle is composed of three sets of distinct fibers. The anterior, or front deltoid, originates on the clavicle, or collarbone, and inserts on the humerus bone of the upper arm. The lateral, or side deltoid, originates on the top of the scapula, or shoulder blade, also inserting on the humerus, and the posterior, or rear deltoid, inserts a little further back on the scapula, still inserting on the humerus. Because the main shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint, it has a very high degree of freedom, meaning the muscles that act on it can perform a bunch of different functions. But for this video, we're going to focus on the primary joint actions. The anterior delt's primary function is shoulder flexion, or raising your arm up like in a front raise. The lateral delt performs primarily abduction, or lifting your arm out to the side like in a lateral raise. And the rear delt performs primarily horizontal shoulder abduction, or moving your arms apart horizontally like in a bent over reverse fly. And while this video will focus primarily on the deltoid muscle, it's worth mentioning that the shoulder joint is also acted on by four muscles of the rotator cuff, which primarily act as shoulder stabilizers in internal and external rotators. So while they may not contribute much to the appearance of shoulder size and aesthetics, keeping the rotator cuff muscles strong can help promote training longevity. Simply adding internal and external cable rotations at the beginning of your workout is one way to improve the health of the shoulder joint. Multiple lines of research indicate that the deltoid is nearly a dead even 50-50 split of type 1 or slow twitch and type 2 or fast twitch muscle fibers, which implies that, as usual, using a combination of high reps and low reps is the best way to optimize total muscle development. I think that a cornerstone exercise for any shoulder-focused routine is a press. According to American strength training coach and author Mark Ripito, the press is the most useful upper body exercise for sports conditioning. And if I could use only one exercise to build the shoulders, it'd probably be some sort of press. A 2010 study by Trebs et al. found that a flat or zero degree incline led to the worst anterior delt EMG activity when compared with the 28, 44, and 56 degree incline, each of which showed similar activation levels, although there was a trend for more activation with more incline. And this is in line with previous research from Barnett et al. showing that more shoulder activation was achieved with higher inclines in a later 2015 paper by Lauvet et al. Based on this data as a whole, it appears that inclines between 28 to 90 degrees all activate the front deltoid to a large degree, but it can't be said that one angle is significantly better than the others. However, on my analysis, the trend seems to suggest that, all else equal, more incline equals more delt involvement. So what about dumbbells versus barbells? A 2013 study compared deltoid EMG activity with four variations of the shoulder press. Standing barbell press, standing dumbbell press, seated barbell press, and seated dumbbell press, using 80% of a predetermined one rep max for five reps on each exercise. Front delt activation was found to be higher with the dumbbells in both the standing press and the seated press, indicating that as far as activation is concerned, dumbbells reign king. And while the lateral and rear delts are activated much less than the front delts in all of these vertical pressing movements, the standing dumbbell press did come out on top for both of these heads as well. It seems that the front delts can be trained optimally through the use of pressing alone, such as by including at least one horizontal press and one vertical press in your training routine. And front raises don't seem to be of much utility here, since not only are they often redundant, they also just aren't as good at activating the front delts as dumbbell shoulder presses, at least according to Sweeney 2014, which showed front raises to elicit only 57% activation relative to maximum voluntary contraction versus the 74% seen with dumbbell shoulder presses. Scientific fitness author Michael Gundel cited bodybuilders on average as having five times the front delt development of normal, untrained folks, but only three times the side delts, and only 10 to 15 percent more rear delt size. This indicates that there's the most room for improvement with side and rear delt components. Compared to the front delts, the side delts are activated much less in pressing movements. One 2013 paper showed the side delts to exhibit only about 20% muscle activity in the Smith Machine shoulder press, compared to about 70% for the front delts. A later 2014 paper found the same basic result. The shoulder press was better at activating the front delts than the side delt. However, using dumbbells instead of the Smith Machine seemed to get the side delts more involved, an effect that can probably be attributed to a stabilizing role of the side delts missing with use of the Smith Machine. So while using a free weight press can lead to more side delt activation relative to a Smith Machine press, it still isn't able to isolate isolate them from the front delt and really develop that X-frame appearance. For this, I think exercises that train shoulder abduction directly are needed. 
That 2013 study by Button et al. found the top three heavy hitters for lateral delts to be the dumbbell lateral raise, cable lateral raise, and reverse pec delt. Biomechanically speaking, internal rotation of the shoulder should lead to more lateral delt involvement on lateral raises because of fiber orientation and line of pull, a contention supported by Bohek, Behrens, and Busky's EMG data. However, many experts suggest that internally rotating or pointing the pinkies up increases shoulder impingement and injury risk. So if you want to play it safe or have a history of shoulder problems, the slight increase in activation from this pinkies up cue may not be worth the potential risk it presents. But as a single example, I've been using this cue for 11 years now and haven't run into any issues personally. Stopping the raise at or just below shoulder height and keeping the scapula retracted seems to be protective in my experience. One potential benefit of using cables over dumbbells is the more constant resistance curve. Dumbbells reach peak torque at the top end of the range of motion and virtually no tension is on the delt at the bottom of the range. Using cables ensures tension throughout the entire range of motion. And since some research shows that leaning away into the direction of the raise takes emphasis away from the supraspinatus and places it onto the side delt, my favorite variation currently is the lean away between the legs cable lateral raise. Another effective exercise for side delt stimulation is the upright row. A 2013 study by McAllister et al. compared three different grip widths and found that a wide grip led to greater side delt EMG activity than a close or shoulder width grip. And for what it's worth, the wider grip also led to more rear delt and trap activation as well. However, since improper technique on an upright row has been linked to shoulder impingement, the authors of this study recommend keeping elbow elevation below shoulder height to minimize injury risk. I personally find that using a rope allows for more freedom at the shoulder joint in a more comfortable end position. I also cue myself to pull the rope apart as I row, which in my experience turns on the side delts more than simply rowing straight up. And finally, that brings us to the oft neglected rear delts, a muscle important not only for a balanced looking posterior, but also for postural and shoulder health generally. But Natal found that the rear delts were nearly silent in shoulder presses, and other data suggests they barely contract in the bench press, push up, and other pressing movements, and according to EMG expert Brett Contreras, quote, isolation exercises for the rear delts kick the shit out of compound movements. Back to Button Natal. The reverse pec deck, incline lat pulldown, and seated row were the big three for the rear delts, but it's worth noting that three studies from Frank, Button, and Schoenfeld all independently showed the reverse pec deck to elicit about 90% EMG activity for the rear delts. Interestingly, a 2013 study by Schoenfeld et al. found that a neutral, or palms facing each other hand position, increased mean activity of the rear delts. However, co-author Brett Contreras later commented that some subjects saw greater activation with the pronated, or palms down grip, implying that you should play around with both and see what hand position feels best for you and your rear delts. And while data is limited, it's likely that other similar horizontal abduction-based exercises like reverse flies and reverse cable crossovers would also highly recruit the rear delts. Exercises like rows are also effective, but since the traps can take over, including isolation movements on days you train shoulders or back is the best way to optimize their development. Volume expert Dr. Mike Isertel suggests that front delt isolation work isn't required to make progress since horizontal and incline or vertical pressing is sufficient. For both side and rear delts, eight weekly sets of isolation work per week stands as a minimum for progress, with double that or 16 to 22 weekly sets being a pretty optimal place for progress for most intermediate to advanced trainees. Just keep in mind the caveat that many, quote, isolation exercises target both the side and rear delts and would count as a set for both under this scheme. Training the shoulders at least two times per week is supported by the most recent literature on training frequency. However, my experience working in the field suggests that isolation work for the side and rear delts can be performed as frequently as four to five times per week, especially if they're lagging behind other body parts without recovery issues. Recommendations for training volume and frequency for both men and women will depend on your level of advancement and are made in my shoulder hypertrophy programs. So, if you take these training principles and apply them to an already sound, fundamental training philosophy centered around consistency and progressive overload, a pair of 3D delts are there for you, waiting to be built. What's going on everyone? Uh, so don't click out of the video just yet. I have a few important things I want to touch on. First is that I released my shoulder hypertrophy program for both men and women on my website today. And the main difference between the two is that the women's program has less of an emphasis on the traps, whereas the men's program has some carryover in the exercise selection between the traps and the shoulders. And that's just based on the fact that in my experience, women tend not to want to build their traps as much as the delts. And the other differences are basically just physiological ones that I touched on in my sex differences science explained video. And if you're 
familiar with my body part specialization programs, then you know that these are better thought of as training manuals and not just training programs. So this really has everything you could ever want to know about the shoulders in one place. It does have a complete eight week training program, but also all of the scientific information to do with periodization, progression schemes, every exercise that's included in the program is given a full defense for why it's there, complete with all the scientific references. So you can get that for $19.99 on my website for the first week of launch. And then after that, it'll go up to $24.99. And also guys, I did release a footnote to this video that explores some topics that I just didn't have the chance to in this one. It digs a little bit deeper and I'd really appreciate your guys' participation on that video. Please go check that one out. And until next time, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.